Hello again, welcome back to the channel. It's been a little bit. Um, I recorded a video last week that I ended up not being happy with, so I'll probably just redo that one at some point soonish. Um, today, I just figured I'd do a little bit of another tournament prep video. Um, as you can see up on the screen, uh, I'm going to uh, the Ducks Travaganza 2 Battle for the Pond in Westminster, Maryland this weekend. Um, I went to this tournament last year. It was good. It was awesome, in fact. Um, the Knights of the Pond, the great crew up there, um, great little local scene in Westminster, and those tournaments also get people traveling from like kind of all over the East Coast. Um, so it's usually a good time. This one looks like it's going to be a little bit smaller than the GT I was there for in the spring. Um, there's, I think, 41 people were registered, and there's been some drops. Um, sadly, I don't think, yeah, I can't quite see lists yet. Um, and yeah, on BCP on the web app, you can't see um, can't see factions, which is kind of annoying. Um, unlike the app, but from what I can see, um, you know, not everybody has shown their factions yet, but it seems seems to be a good balance. And it seems like the balance of the game as a whole right now is in a really good place. Um, I know at, I, know, I wanted to say Nova, Tampa. Um, at Tampa Open um, last weekend, the top 10 had nine different factions in it, which is amazing. Um, I think 11th place was yet another faction. Uh, I think it was, I think 11th place was, I could look it up. I want to say it was, Agnef Deepkin was in 11th. Um, so yeah, so like 10 different factions in the top 11 is just kind of amazing. It seems like the meta is in a nice balanced place right now. Um, so, so it doesn't really feel like there's a need to, um, you know, it's not like, it doesn't feel like you're going to see a dozen Seraphon at a tournament or something right now, or like a dozen OBR. Seems like everyone has has kind of branched back out again, so there doesn't seem to be a need to build like specifically to counter anything. It seems like now is the time to just kind of build a good general list against the field, against all the different armies you might face, um, and it's and it's kind of coming down more to player skill, which it always comes down to player skill. But when the meta is a little more balanced, I think that's even more true. Um, I did see, so looking at the factions on the um, on the mobile app on BCP, I did see the two the two people who are listed as playing OBR are playing Crematorians uh, and not in the whole Myriad. So I think that is an interesting development. Um, Travis, who was on the stream a little while ago, um, was telling me for ages and ages, he was like, oh my god, Crematorians is the best. It's amazing. You should just take Crematorians all the time. Um, I think they are good. I don't think they're, you know, I don't think they're far and away better than like all the other sub-factions. Melmiriad obviously plays a very important role in the meta uh, in countering some armies. and is very strong. Um, all of this is a little moot for me because I'm not taking OBR this weekend. I am finally taking my Cruel Boys out to a tournament. Um, this will be the first tournament I'm taking Cruel Boys. Um, I think they're my best painted army, and I'm really gunning for best painted at this tournament. Um, so I'm excited to hopefully do well in that regard. Um, I I have some pictures. Let's see. I brought up, I pulled up a couple, you know, questionable quality pictures um, just to give a little preview. This is my break boss. Um, you can see I really went like. This, this was the army I really wanted to go all out on the basing. So you can't really tell here, but the, you know, there's resin in all the swamp water, rocks, I have plants, I have, you know, little logs and things sticking out. Um, my sludge raker beast, you know, same thing. Um, hopefully you think this is well painted, but <laughs> I'm very proud of all the bases. You know, there's some dead stormcast stuff down there, all the swampy goodness, all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, so I I I've had this list like ninety this army ninety percent painted for like a year and a half now. I I did Stormcast and Crew Blaze, so I got the Dominion box when it came back out. That was my that was my jump back into Warhammer point, um, and I painted those 
both up and I like bought enough stuff for each army to build a match to 2000 points. And I took Stormcast to a bunch of tournaments and I still haven't taken Cool Blaze out. So this week I spent a bunch of time finishing that like last 10% of the painting on this army. Um, so there was just a bunch of stuff like little skulls I had painted, had not painted or like, you know, parts of standard bearers I hadn't painted, like the drum skin on a drummer. Like there was just a bunch of little stuff like that that I hadn't painted. Um, so I, um, I finished all that. I also ordered a bunch of extra basing bits that I'm super sad I did not get in. Or if I can pull up real quick, just a picture of what I ordered. Give me one second. I should have been prepared of this. Um, I ordered a bunch of resin bits from Green Stuff World of like mushrooms and and little plants and things like that. And then, um, oh, come on, there we go. Let's let's pull this up. Uh, the stuff I was really excited about. So obviously you can see this is the Duck Stravaganza GT. It's being run by the Knights of the Pond is the club name. And uh, one of the things I ordered for basing was I found these resin geese duck guys um, on Etsy from uh, Mungo's Marvelous Minis. I think Goon Master is the sculptor. Um, so I was going to put, you know, I was going to put a couple ducks like in the swamp on the bases and, you know, maybe have uh, instead of a pot grot, have the little wizard duck um, for one of my shamans. So I was I was all stoked about that. And I think they're going to arrive. Um, I think they're arriving tomorrow. So like they'll probably get to my house while I'm at the tournament. So I was like, you know, if I'm at this duck extravaganza GT with the Knights of the Pond and I have actual ducks on my bases, you know, I got to be shooing for best painted. <laughs> but sadly, that didn't happen. Um, I'd also ordered, I think, from the same store, um, had some like rocks with um, like little salamanders on it and like some cattails and just more swampy things that I figured I could either add to bases or um, I haven't made a display board for this army yet, so could make a display board. So anyway, just a lot of a lot of talk about painting. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about strategy and my list and things. Um, so my list, uh, the points in Crowboys have gone down enough at this point that this list is basically just everything that I had painted. Uh, I think the only models I had painted that aren't in this list are a foot kill a boss and the Merc Nob with Belcha Banner. And I do have 20 more gut rippers that are unassembled and unpainted and I think also 20 more upgrades. But I did not, for this weekend, feel like assembling and painting 20 more of anything. <laughs> so I basically made a list out of what I have. And also, I, I just I like my paint jobs on all like the big monsters. So I wanted to use all the big monsters. So um, yeah, I'm playing Greening Blades, which is just I think, flat out the best. Cause if you play KO or anything, it's, it's just amazing. Um, anything with range, obviously, you can't be seen outside of 12 inches. That's just fantastic. Um, honestly, it's a little bit like Null Myriad, where like Null Myriad, you're like, haha, I'm just immune to magic. Grinning Blades, you're like, cool, I'm just immune to getting blown up from far away. Um, my grand strategy is crump them all. Probably a mistake, um, but that's fine. <laughs> Whatever. Um, I'm going to try it out. I, I should say, I only have, I have like two or three games under my belt with. Um, with Crow Boys, so I'm not super, super experienced with this army. I, I was very undecided on what I thought the best Grand Strat was. So Crumple Mall is you complete the strategy if there are fewer than three enemy units on the battlefield at the end of the game. Um, so this is just this is just a win more. This is like I'm I'm winning, I'm gonna table my opponent, so here's my Grand Strat. Um, Wog, I was just so Wog you need to of the model picked to be your general or a friendly battle line unit wholly within enemy territory. Um, my battle line is the two gut rippers and the hobgrot slittos. And my general is the um, snatch boss on Sludrake Beast. And I think, I'm trying to remember what my thought was as to why I thought Wog might be, wasn't the thing to do over Crumple Mall. I think I was just worried that, like, you know, my slittos are screens, they'll probably die. Got Ripa's good chance of dying in combat, and you know the snatch bot. 
I, whatever, you know, I, either one I think would be hard if you're not already winning. Um, if you're losing, you're not going to get Crumpet Mall or Wog probably because Wog, you're not going to have a general or battle line unit in their territory. And Crumpet Mall, obviously, if you're not killing the army, you're not going to get that. So I don't know. It, it was kind of a coin flip for me. Um, I'll go through the list. Um, I am at 1960, so I have a very good triumph bid. Um, so I have inspired for the plus one wound there. Um, I have the kill boss on Great Nash Tooth. Uh, I gave him Fasten. I had originally had Fasten on the break boss on Meyer Brute Traga, um, just because he's so slow. He's only five inches. And I was like, you know, maybe do super sneaky to throw the break boss in their backfield turn one. Um, if they give me first turn, then like he can do the five inch movement with fast on and then normal move and like hopefully get in turn one. Whereas, you know, gotta be nine inches away. Um, if he's, you know, uh, just move five and redeploy, you know, you might be looking at like a six inch charge or something. If, you know, you're four away and they redeploy two, whatever. Um, but one of my friends, Roger, um, Asked, you know, have you thought about putting Fasten on the kill boss? Because he's moved 10 and he does hit decently hard and he's he's decently tanky with a three up save. And of course, he is also only 120 points. Um, so yeah, he recommended that. And I really liked that idea because with move 10, suddenly, you know, on the turn you Fasten, you have a 20 inch move essentially. So like a 20, you know, an easy 26, 27 inch threat range. And the other thing is, um, unlike the slower break a boss, if I were to like, if I were to super sneaky kill a boss, turn one like into the back corner, I could super sneaky this guy um, far enough away from the enemy that like he's not really in danger. So like be out of you know twelve or honestly be out of like seventeen inches away from any um, any shooting but then still have the speed um, to get into the backfield and threaten it from that far away in a single turn. So, so I kind of like the idea of super sneaking this kill a boss on Nash Tooth back into their backfield, like, like I said, 17, 20 inches away from anything. And then um, hopefully if they give, you know, if they were to give me first, maybe, maybe have an opening to get into like a wizard or just, something in their backfield turn one to tie it up and you know go um go find a tower and all that good stuff um yeah it just it seems cute i'll be i'll be curious to see how it turns out so i have the nash i have the break boss on trogoth um it's just it's just too good of a moderate model to not take <laughs> it looks cool i love it um and it has the possibility to do some damage uh the games i had yeah it, i i tried to do that like I said, I I played a couple games like a year ago with these guys and had Fasten on the Trogoth and kind of threw him back in the backfield with Super Sneaky and like wasn't super impressed with how he did. Part of that was just the armies I was playing. Like I played a game against Night Haunt, which is ethereal and is kind of the worst case scenario to throw him into because he's like Ren 2, 3 damage, big attacks, and they spike on 4 up ethereal saves. And it's just like, well, that sucks. Um, but I think in this list, he's going to function more as a second counter puncher. So kind of hanging out behind the front line um, with the snatch a boss and counter charge into something and hopefully beat it up. Um, I have two shamans. Uh, the first one has Merciless Blizzard. So this guy I'm, in, I'm intending when he's not in Merciless Blizzard range to be the guy who's casting the War Scroll spell which gives board wide minus one to charge to the enemy and plus one to charge to Crowblades, which is freaking amazing. Um, the other Swamp Gala Shaman has Choking Mist. Um, so that's the uh, lore spell that you pick a point within, I think it's 24 inches and anything within six inches of that point until your next hero phase has minus one attack and can't run. Which is just so good. the The Cruel Boys lore has always been amazing, but it has higher casting values. Like I think three out of the four spells are casting value seven. Um, the last one is six. I can't remember which one it is. I'll have to remind myself. Um, so it's always been a little hard to get the spells off since you don't have any pluses to cast. 
but the uh, Primal Dice this season just helps so much uh, with that if you want to get an important spell off being able to chuck primals at it. Um, so these two are in the Andoran Acolyte Battalion, so they are also hopefully on a three-up generating extra primal dice, just for me, to give me that advantage. And the other thing those primal dice are good for is with Gobsprack. Uh, he's obviously amazing in this handbook because his, um, if he dispels, so he has two dispels. If he dispels something, he does D3 mortal wounds. And if he rolled a 10 or more on his dispel, um, he does d6 mortal wounds to the caster. So this is one of sorry, this is one of the few things that does not specify unmodified. So you can also be checking primal dice at Gobsprack's dispel uh, to boost it to that 10 up and make getting dispelled really scary, just constantly looking at maybe d6 mortal wounds if he dispels things. Uh, and then of course he also has the once per game he can just natively throw three d6 dice to dispel something, um, which is also good for that. So hopefully he does a bunch of work. He's also a monster, you know, he moves 14 inches, um, can roar or stop things or bust up faction train. So good all around. And then last but not least, uh, the Snatcher boss. Um, he has super sneaky. So that's the thing where after setting up, but before determining the first turn, <laughs> you can tell I've been like, I've, I've been reviewed. Look, it's important to know your army. I haven't played this much. I have been reviewing <laughs> when the timing is for like the dirty tricks at the beginning and the super sneaky and all of that, because it's all slightly different. So super sneaky is um, pretty sure it is after setup, but before determining who has first turn, you can take something from your army and pick it up and redeploy it anywhere further than nine inches from the enemy. That's what I was talking about with you know the killer boss. Um, I was also very up in the air on what to give, what magic item to use to give anyone, whether it was him or somebody else. Um, I decided on obviously the arcane tome, as you can see here, just thinking that it's never bad to just have an extra mystic shield um, or even casting an arcane bolt on like the turn that he charges in and you know counter charges and goes in on something um so yeah and it's an extra dispel he's an arm no, whatever that's fine got an arcane tome it's never bad um i think with grinning blades the five aboard versus shooting for a turn is it's still probably not bad but there's just there's so many strong armies right now in the meta well, like I said, <laughs> the meta is very balanced, but there's so many strong armies that don't have shooting that um, doubling up on that just doesn't feel good. Like it, it doesn't help you at all against death or against corn or all sorts of things. Um, so that one was out. I thought about the um, the eye biter ash that gives something within three inches minus one to hit either for the turn or for the rest of the game, uh, depending on your d6 roll. It can also just fail to do anything because it's cruel boys. Um, but I, I don't know. I felt that I, I feel like if I'm committing to snatch a boss, I'm tr hoping to kill the thing I'm going into. Um, so that didn't seem amazing either. That maybe would have been nice to to have like just as a little thing, sit this guy behind like ten gut ribbas, but within three inches of the front, so that if something charges them, he could he could like minus one to hit uh, the thing charging in. Uh, that could combine. The gut ripples already have minus one to hit against things that aren't heroes or monsters. So, you know, that, that would just be extra insurance if it was like, uh, you know, a mega boss on Law Crusher charged in or something. Um, but either way, whatever. I decided to go with Arcane Tome. And then rounding it out, I already mentioned Battle Line. I have two by 10 gut rippers. I have two by 10 slitters. I then have the kill bow again, mostly because it's a really cool model. And there's always the chance it could pop off and do like, 10 wounds to a Gargant or something. Uh, and then I have six Bolt Boys, and I have three Bolt Boys. So only nine total. Um, Jake Brandon, who has done well with Cool Boys lately, um, who's in my group, um, usually goes two by six and a little less of the heroes. But this is my list. It's a little different. Who cares? Um, I also have the Suffocating Gravetide, just as a horde clearing thing, 
Um, so yeah, Grave Tide to clear hordes, um, mortal wounds, obviously at range and in combat, uh, dealing with more elite things, and then uh, Gobsprack, since he knows the whole lore, also knows uh, the Black Pit. That is another horde clearing option. Um, I should double check and remind myself. Right, it's only 12 inch range. Um, and that is one of the ones that is better if the unit has a better save. So like against Annihilators with three up save, uh, it's a die for each model in the unit. Um, and it's for every roll that's equal to or greater than the save characteristic, uh, you do a mortal wound. So, so it's kind of, <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay at clearing hordes. It, it, I feel like that's a good middle ground spell. It's okay at clearing hordes because you always succeed on a six at least and most things have a five up save. So kind of the same as um, suffocating grave tide, uh, but also good at doing some wounds to uh, more elite things. Um, so that's the list. It's a six drop. Um, I have the Acolyte Battalion. I have two battle regiments, and then the Kill a Boss and the Break a Boss are not in a reg uh, not in a battalion at all. I think this is one of the things that Cruel Boys really suffers is just you don't have good battalion options if you're taking like these characters because they're all ten wounds. So <laughs> pretty much every battalion you can put one model with ten wounds in it, and then some of them you require. You're required, you know, like Warlord, you're required to take multiple little heroes. So, like, it was kind of the decision do you take Warlord or do you take Andorran Acolytes? I think Andorran Acolytes is clearly better. Um, I know Jacob's List, he actually takes three shamans. Um, so, he has a little redundancy in that, um, in that battalion in case one of the guys dies. Because for Andorran Acolytes to work, to get them to be able to roll for the primal, you have to have two uh, wizards from the battalion left alive. So if I only have two, if I lose one, I, I won't get to roll. Um, yeah, so that's the list. Um, people talk a lot. Good people. <laughs> people, people who seem to be competitive online um, and, and good at the game talk a lot about the importance of like having a plan um, for deployment and like your battle tactics. Um, so I'm just going to take a quick look at what the scenarios are. Um, right. Round one is Spring the Trap. Round two is Pulse. Round three is Limited Resources. Round four is Fountains of Frost. And round five is Every Step is Forward. Um, so no uh, Zephyr to limit my shooting. So that's good for me. No Ice Fields, which is lame because Ice Fields is the best, as we have gone over before. Um, so yeah, terrain layout, pretty standard two area terrain, two defensible, two impassable, two wildwoods. So the standard eight pieces of terrain. Um, so let's see, thinking about, I'll just, I'll just think real quick. This, this ratio, <laughs> this height to width ratio looks pretty accurate for, um, for the table. So just thinking real quick, Geomantic Pulse and Fountains of Frost are both ones with the 11 inch deployment zone. So something like this. So they're the small deployment zones. So you are starting at, at the closest, you will be 22 inches away from each other to start. That is as opposed to the scenarios where your territory goes all the way up to the middle, but you have to be nine inches away, so you can start 18 away from the enemy. Um, or no risk, no reward, where you can start combat if you want, which is amazing. Uh, so I think on these, so an issue with being six drops is I feel like I will probably mostly get out dropped, and they will have the option to give me first or second. Um, People generally take second for the chance at you know the better chance at controlling when the double happens, um, if it happens. So I'm expecting a lot of people will. I'm, I'm expecting people will mostly give me first. Um, I do think that super sneaky maybe will make people think twice about that. 
um, just if like, you know, if they didn't deploy in like a nice tight castle, if I put that fast kill a boss like in a corner or something where it could get to something important first turn, um, could maybe make people think twice about giving me first and then, you know, that would give me a tip of double. But I think I'm going to, I'm always going to deploy as if I'm going to take first, I think. So on these far, um, on these far deployments, I think the big thing for me to consider is I want to be able to shoot first turn um, if I get first. And the, the weird thing about Cruel Boy shooting ranges is that if you move your shooting range, it's cut in half. <laughs> so both boys, um, you know, shoot 24, as does the, the big bow. Um, but if you move, it's only 12 inches. So you essentially have, and then you get, you get double the amount of shots if you moved or if you're within three inches of the enemy. So um, effectively, you have a 17 inch range with double shots or a 24 inch range with their single shots. Um, so I think the important thing for these far away deployments is to, no, not yet, let me select this. Um, I think the important thing is to be right up near the edge with the bolt boys. Um, if they don't have anything, I, th I think if they don't have anything that could conceivably get to me first turn, if they take first, I might just deploy the bolt boys right on the line, just to give me the most size six and three. Um, just to give me the most options on like what to shoot turn one. Um, and then I think if they are playing more of an alpha army, like if they're playing like an Iron Jaws or something, I think then what I do is I get the Bolt Boys screened first turn. Um, so I do something like that. And let's just call these um, Hobgrats. So it, one of the decisions, so the, the Gut Rippers are actually, Obviously, a better screen. Um, I was going to say whatever these are. These are screens. Um, the gut ribbons are are more survivable than the hobgrots, but their bases are wider. So if I'm really if I'm really trying to maximize, I need a screen and I need to be within range. I guess I put the hobgrots in front. Um, but now that I'm thinking about it, if I need a screen, I don't want the Bolt Boys sitting behind the screen to, or sorry, um, yeah, I don't want the Bolt Boys behind the screen to be like within a two inch melee reach anyway. Um, so it's probably safe to just screen, assume I'm going to screen with the Gut Rippers um, in that case. So yeah, I think, I think in this case, I've Gut Rippers in front. Um, if I... See, whatever. Sludge Rigger is going to go in the middle. Um, so, yeah, if they don't have anything to get to me first turn, I think the Bull Boys go in front and like the Gut Rippers can kind of fill in around the sides or even in the middle. Um, so, the relevant range on the Sludge Rigger aura is 12 inches. So, I think there's probably, probably room to like. I've I've backed myself into a corner here with this crappy little diagram. Razor tool. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is I think there's there's probably space in the aura to have the bolt boys right up in the front. This is hilarious and terrible. Um, have the bolt boys up in the front. Oh my god! Of course that's gonna. <laughs> this is what you get for using amazing technology like paint. Um, anyway, have the bolt boys up on the front line. And then have um, the gut rippers just kind of one unit probably hugging the sledge raker, and the other unit, you know, maybe a little further out on the flank here or something like that. Um, I think the hobgrats will be good for so for these the hobgrats will be very good throwaway units um, beyond a flank just to get. Um, Turn one, get a, what is it? Surround and destroy. 
So, you know, I can throw my little shitty 80 point units out here and just move them out of my territory to get surround and destroy on these two board edges. God. Um, so that would be a good turn one tactic in this case if I don't need them for screens uh, in the middle. Um, shaman, you know, one of the shamans could obviously be sitting back a little bit, although I think in this case, um, I think in this case, I would actually do the Trogoth, the break of off boss on Trogoth for the one that needs to be um, within six inches of my back line, because I do want both shamans able to hand out poison up here to the bolt boys. So and these colors don't mean anything anymore. So I think Mr. Counterpunchy um, Trogoth first turn sits on the back line, well, within six inches, and gets that for first turn tactic. And then, um, sorry, and the shamans, the shamans can sit up and pass out their their poisons up there. Um, so those are my thoughts on that for for setting up on the far deployments. Um, probably on pulse. So pulse has four objectives across. I think it is probably just better to hold the middle. And so whichever direction the pulse is coming from, be ready to hold the middle two points, like turns two through, you know, two on, three on. Um, so even if for some reason I don't have the pulse turn two right when it comes on, be able to hold that for the rest of the game in the middle and set up my castle in the middle and, and shoot and kill things. Um, right, other thoughts? Um, yeah, so, so I think turn one tactic, like I said, I'd be setting up to do surround and destroy early on these close deployments just since I have um, kind of throwaway, throwaway things. Um, I could also potentially, since the um, since the, the extra damage from like the Sludge Rigger isn't very important for the Big Bow, um, the Big Bow could also go on one of these flanks to be my Surround and Destroy on one side. Um, so yeah, I think Surround and Destroy turn one is probably um, the tactic to do turn two. Um, possibly going for the do 10 wounds without taking 10 wounds back Cruel Boys tactic, uh, depending on how their first turn went, and you know, maybe potentially their double turn. You know, if, if we're still not engaged turn two, um, I, could, I could do that tactic. Um, if not, turn two is also a good opportunity to um, get Intimidate, just move out and get Intimidate. Um, the Cruel Boys tactic, sorry, I'm moving things around needlessly and being distracting. Uh, the Cruel Boys tactic to have everything near terrain um, feels to me like a good later game tactic to hold on to. Um, and then there is always also the possibility of doing magic dominance if I'm out of 30 and they give me turn one. Um, I do think that. Let's see. I do think that I would like to have Gobsprack at least in dispel range, turn one. Um, so he's probably deployed pretty far up, depending on um, depending on how they're deploying. So I probably hold against things with magic that that matters against. I probably hold um, Gobsprack and the shamans as my last three deployments. So so Gobsprack's in a battle regiment with the the bolt boys. Um, so I probably hold those till till later just to see how they set up their wizards and, and see about magic dominance. Uh, so that's my thoughts on that one. The, probably the weirdest one is um, the, every step is forward, because that's the weird like Z deployment. So your territory is, your territory is, I'm just gonna, oh, screw it. Um, your territories look something like this, and that means that your area you can deploy in. There's this weird little two inch strip down here, and it curves around and goes up there. You have to be outside of nine, so it's this weird ass deployment. Um, this is, and then there, sorry, the objectives are objectives are going to be stars. The objectives are like here. 
know what? Let's let's not be political. <laughs> let's not use the star update. Um, look, nothing nothing against them, but let's use a five pointed star. Be all satanic about it instead. Um, I think the objectives are here. It's something like this. Yeah, right. So it's something like that. Um, so this is a good candidate to have like a turn one throw away, throw away unit over here um, to get this objective that doesn't need to be with your whole army. Um, so obviously, I have great throwaway units in Hobgrats. Um, so probably just Hobgrats down here, or um, and even, you know, depending on how they're deployed and everything, could even just super sneaky something over here. Um, if I just want to deploy all together over here, then, you know, they deploy thinking I'm not putting anything over here, and then I, whatever, I can super sneaky. I'm probably overthinking this. It's not that tricky of a move. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. Um, again, here, this is, um, this is the closer deployment. Um, so this, Despite all the wonky weirdness, you can be 18 away um, when all is said and done. So this, and then um, uh, which one is it? This and limited resources, right? And spring the trap are all you can be 18 inches away. Um, so in those cases, I think again, depending on the speed of the opponent's army, um, I think on 18 inch deployments, I just always screen in front of the bolt boys to start. Um, and in fact, against some armies, maybe double screen. So I can have, you know, I could do, um, do some green guys. So I could do like Hobgrats, Hobgrats, Gut Rippers, Gut Rippers, Bolts, Bolts, if I'm like really scared. Maybe the big bow to be on the side and like snatch a boss, blah blah blah. Beautiful diagrams. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it, it probably probably only need single screen against a lot of things. Um, that especially if they're not going to get to me first turn, and then I'm just looking at the double. Um, like if they can't get to me first turn, they're going to come in turn two. Um, I think a single screen is fine. Um, obviously, things like Iron Jaws, where they can like um, activate, like like re whatever recharge in whatever the whatever the Iron Jaws shit is, um, can complicate that. But generally, I think um, yeah, probably a single screen is fine. And throw hot box over here. Um, God, spring the trap. I feel like nobody ever picks up a unit to redeploy. Um, just seems kind of silly. Most. Most times I haven't encountered a case where it's actually good. Um, just as a reminder, spring the trap is where you have the narrow deployment zones. So your deployment zones are like here, territory. Um, your territories are that, and then you have uh, uh, so you're 18 inches away from each other. You have the narrow deployment and then the um, Objectives. There's one in the middle, and there is one off to each side. Oop. So this one, usually my plan is, you know, just com commit to two and don't care about the third one, and just always get one, two more, and be outscoring. Um, so I think, you know, depending on how terrain is, I think this is very much a castle up, you know, on one side of your deployment zone. Be ready to control. Um, the middle and whichever one you pick. And then, you know, depending on what they're doing, maybe just have one little shitbag unit that can come over here and just force them to deal with it. Um, especially if like, um, so like I have a lot of units um, against something like, um, like that Knights of the Empty Throne list I played at Goonhammer, um, something like OBR, um, just even Sons, I guess, even Sons of Behemoth. Um, things with low unit counts, just just throwing some shitty little unit over on the third objective and saying you're you're either gonna have to commit one of your big scary units of which you have like five, 
um, to kill my little 80 point unit and take this for a turn or two, you're going to be over here and not helping deal with the rest of my army. Or they just like concede that point and you just get that point, which is great. Um, yeah, and then Fountains of Frost. Um, yeah, Fountains of Frost is the, the short deployment zones. Um, I didn't mention that's the one where if you have more than if you have three or more units um, contesting the same objective in the battle shock phase, it might blow up and do mortal wounds to all of you. So that complicates building the little crew boys castle just a little bit, but that should be fine. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to go too long on this. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this weekend. I'm really hoping I do well on painting. Um, I would. You know, if I if I took a little more time, I would get a little more into like battle tactics plans for the the rest of the scenarios. Um, this is one. <laughs> this is one where I always mess up turn one intimidate, where I'm just like I don't plan well enough <laughs> to get units out to the sides, and I just kind of it you know it ends up working out, but I I'm always scrambling and I didn't really explicitly set up for it. So um, the good news is depending on terrain, this might be one to just commit to doing the cruel boys, everybody be within three inches of terrain at the end of the turn tactic. Um, so I don't have to worry so much about getting things out the sides, um, to do intimidate. Um, this is also, this is one. So the other thing with like the net, the fasten, like I don't have to commit that to going in. It is also possible to do um, save that for a later turn where I just need to like get something to the edge to do surround. So like if we're dealing with shit in here and I'm like, all right, I can just go 20 inches to the side, well, or like 23, 24 with a run. Um, he can, you know, he can get out to do surround if I need something. If I need something like on their back or on the side, what have you. Um, I don't think. I don't think this one, this one is, obviously this one is not easy at all to commit to doing Surround and Destroy first turn. So I think it's either set up to do Intimidate and get out um, or put the Magic Casters on the backfield and commit to doing Magic Dominance. But I care more about Dispelling than Casting, I think, with Gobsprack. Like I, I want to be Dispelling and Hurting their Wizards. Um, so I think no on that. Or, um, or like I said, just the, the cruel boys um, either do the be close to train one if I go first, or if they've gone first and gotten into range for some reason, <laughs> uh, yeah, just do 10 wins. Um, yeah, all right, so that's it. So I did talk a little bit about battle tactics there. Um, thank you for listening. I'm definitely going to do a recap of this tournament. Um, hopefully it goes well. Um, I should mention they are doing best general, you know, 5 best general is first place, but they are also doing best overall. So if you're four, one or better, you can qualify for best overall, which also includes painting score and, um, sportsmanship. Um, so they're doing, you know, they're doing like the favorite opponent thing. So five points per round for 25 points. And then any favorite opponents are five points for 50. Um, so then overall is just a third battle points, a third paint, a third sportsmanship. Um, so I would love, I don't, I don't think I'll go 5-0. I just, I don't have the reps with Cruel Boys um, at all. <laughs> but it would be awesome to go 4-1 and like be in qualifying contention for overall with a good paint score. Um, so we'll shoot for that. Um, I, have, I have high hopes for at least being in the top three for paint. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll say stretch goal is 4-1 and be in contention for overall. Um, yeah, I will, I will see you all in the recap video. Thank you for watching.